you got started? I got started in aquaculture and or in hydroponics through aquaculture. Uh, it was designed into my aquaculture hatchery or my fish hatchery here when I designed it. Um, aqu aquaculture ha is problematic in that you build up nutrients in the water. Those nutrients need to be filtered out in a natural system. They're filtered out by aquatic macrophytes or higher plants. Um, my plan was to eliminate the use of those plants and use those nutrients to grow these plants. Though it was supposed to be a secondary revenue source, the hydroponics is now a primary revenue source because the minnow that I grow and that I hatch here, uh, the red-tailed chub, is heading for extinction levels. Um, we've gotten to the point with wild harvest that the rivers are no longer being able to sustain populations. So I, uh, when I designed the facility to be able to raise them in captivity, um, I didn't want to have to deal with the problems that many of the older hatcheries have been had to deal with higher nitrates and possibility of water contamination. I drink the water out of the ground here. I don't want to contaminate it. Um, the hydroponics has graduated much more quickly than I had planned. Um, even though the original design came from 92, um, the last seven years have been fairly intensive for me going from a novice to the point where I'm at commercial production levels now and uh, plan on uh, the hope and dream of mine, or maybe nightmare of mine, to, to properly phrase it, is to have uh, the capacity to do up to 8,000 heads a week of romaine lettuce um, for local sales. Um, I really believe this comes back to jobs, and I believe that jobs in Staples, we have very limited qualities for industry here. We need jobs that can be here in the future and not jobs that are going to be farmed out in 10 years to China or Japan or Indonesia. Um, as I have progressed in hydroponics, I've grown just about every plant that's been handed to me successfully. Um, I'm rather amazed at the ease of it. Um, it's much less back-breaking work than growing in the ground. Um, and I have bad back, so I can, I can attest to that. Um, it is much, was much easier to learn. Um, you don't necessarily have to understand all the science behind it. Uh, you do have to be able to recognize deficiencies in plants. You have to be able to recognize what's going on and be able to monitor the systems on a daily basis. It requires some somebody, not necessarily me, but somebody has to be here every day to do nutrient adjustments. Um, my facility is strictly man, are manually operated. Um, I have the only automated systems or timers on my, on my watering systems. Um, other than that, I adjust my nutrients, check my nutrients, and adjust them daily. It's not a big problem, and it doesn't take an over uh, building. This building, for instance, um, is uh, it takes me about 25 minutes to do add water and do nutrient adjustments and in the winter time where we're at right now as you can see by all the snow uh, is uh, it takes about probably five minutes because it's not necessary to do it every day the plants aren't using that many nutrients in the winter time the temperature in here is kept about 50 degrees um, it raises higher than that during the daytime when the sun's out, but this is a solar greenhouse. It's not made to be heated year-round. Um, it's made to utilize as much solar capacity as is possible. And I think most of the designs in the future should be set up that way. Tell us a little bit about um, some of the lessons you've learned about the production of kale, spinach, um, romaine, other vegetables. And what tips would you have for others who might be interested in getting started or scaling up their own production? Um, the first thing I would do if I were growing and wanting to learn is I would go on the Internet and I would not necessarily go to any site that's trying to sell you something. Um, go on the Internet, do a Google search. Um, look at, do a Google search on hydroponics. 
and then go to the images. Not the, not the companies that are trying to sell you a system because most of their systems are scaled for hobbyists. Um, we have several in the United States that are scaled for commercial, commercial scale, which is um, Crop King and M Hydro. Um, both of them have great systems. I know people who are using both. Uh, they function very well. Many of them are automated. Uh, don't require you to do anything but monitor them every 24 hours for a few minutes a day to make sure the automation's in, in place. And uh, um, start small. Um, if you want to go to a big, large scale, be aware of what you're getting yourself into. Um, if you don't have a knowledge, then you need somebody in on your team that does have a knowledge of how to grow hydroponically. Um, they need to be able to recognize a nutrient deficiency over a uh, deficiency of, in this case, what you see from the plants, those large leaves are, um, they're old leaves. They could have been harvested two weeks ago, but I didn't, I have too many other things to do, <laughs> didn't, didn't get them harvested, and I always have extras so that I, um, those leaves will get picked and they'll be put into the compost and used for compost somewhere else. Um, but um, you need somebody that has a basic knowledge of what needs to be done. Um, nutrient monitoring, um, reservoirs, you need somebody that, to come in and check and make sure the pumps are operating. Um, you need um, somebody to keep an eye out for pests and pests on any indoor agriculture. If you're growing in a high tunnel, a greenhouse, um, any type of indoor structure, you need somebody monitoring for pests because they carry you carry them in on your clothing from outside. They fly in, they crawl in through a hole. Once they're in the building, they you're giving them, you're, you're not only giving your plants the optimum conditions to grow, you're giving the pests the optimum conditions to grow and they can explode very quickly inside of inside a structure. How have you approached marketing your product? Or if, if you have approached marketing, how have you? I actually put my product, I grew it, I put it out on the market, I allowed people to try it, uh, and it grew from there exponentially on its own. In fact, it grew right now where I can't keep up with, with the demand. Um, I've been trying to get other growers involved in it. Hydroponics is a is an old science, but it's a new science to the United States. And if you look at where the rest of the world is, we are playing catch up. And we would do well to play catch up because when you look at the quality of my produce, you talk to the people who have eaten it, uh, they come back over and over again. If it's not there, I hear about it. Um, and I do the best to make sure that they've got it every week. So you, would you say that the quality in, in some senses has done the marketing for you? Yeah. Um, I, that was my intent in the first place is to bring it out there and allow the public, the people who are going to buy it, to consume it when they thought, when it's their response that drives this. Uh, if you're producing a product that nobody wants to buy, then why are you producing it? And in this case, the product exceeded my expectations. What have you learned about the variety of selection for northern Minnesota? I imagine you'll have some interesting, helpful perspective on this given... You mean in, <laughs> in what we have available or what, what we could have available? I, I would lean more towards the what could we have available and but, but I'd say go, you know, you could answer both or either, whichever you prefer. <laughs> All of our salad crops could be produced locally in Minnesota. Greens and coal crops can be produced year-round easily in Minnesota. Tomatoes and cucumbers will require artificial light, but also could be produced in Minnesota. Uh, we have, if you look in Canada, Manitoba, uh, Montreal, um, Quebec, all of these provinces, cities, have hydroponic production facilities. They have greenhouses operating year-round. They don't buy their produce from Mexico when they can get it locally because they realize it provides jobs for people and people can afford to buy the produce then. Uh, it might be more expensive, but it is much better quality because it hasn't been nine days between the field and, and your table. 
and and in many cases it's going to be a much more nutritious product because it hasn't been so many days out of the field. When you pick a, a fruit off a plant, it begins losing moisture and nutrition immediately. That's the pro part of the problem. Same way with lettuce or anything else. Even my lettuce, when I sell the lettuce, I sell it with the roots attached. I do that because it's a living plant. A person can take that home, you can put it in a vase, you can put water in it, um, as long as it's bottled water or, or well water, untreated well water, and that plant will continue to grow. It's healthier that way. It's easier to pick, and with the hydroponics, there's another advantage. There's no manure involved. The only chance of pathogen comes from these and us, and proper management techniques, GAPS techniques, eliminate those problems or reduce them to almost non-existence. To me, I, the quality, if you want good quality produce in Minnesota in the middle of winter time, you're going to have to find a way to grow it here. What are some of the harvesting considerations for your product? I've actually, harvesting is pretty easy here. Can I go grab something real quick? Please, that'd be great. Good. This is, ready? This is a cheap little invention that I've got. It's this piece of six inch PVC. You can buy this at, at any hardware chain store. This is a produce bag that you can buy on a roll. They're 2,500 to 3,000 to a roll. You put it over the top. You pick the leaves and you put it in. It gives you a bagging system. When I do a, a head of romaine, I slide the entire head of romaine, put the roots in it, slide it all the way through and pull it through the bottom. Um, I can bag, my wife and I can bag up 400 heads of romaine and box them in about two and a half hours. And so most of those considerations are simply adapting things over to what we need. I'm an inventor. I, I'm always inventing things. I'm always working on. If I have a problem with something, I can't find it on the market. I, I build it. We have the technologies available everywhere. And if you don't have it, contact somebody like me that does, and they can find you a way to do it. Um, this is the easiest bagging system that I know of. And if you're doing greens, um, picking picking spinach by the leaf, putting it in, um, we pick, we weigh, we pull it out, we weigh it. Um, you get eight ounces to a bag, you pay two dollars for the bag, that's enough for a good meal or two meals. And it takes probably about, oh, I suppose about two or three minutes for me to pick an eight ounce bag. Um, the kale, I usually package it up ten leaves to a batch, um, depending on the size of the leaves, sometimes a few more. Uh, it comes out to be about six to eight ounces. And that sells for two dollars, three dollars in the winter time because you've got to raise prices to compensate for heating costs. But nobody that I've sold to has complained about the produce, the quality, or the flavor. And that to me is is number one. Uh, the biggest comment that I'm getting is the the deep green quality of the fruit, or of the leaves of, of the produce that I have. And the romaine is the same way. It's 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 a matter of you can identify looking at the plant, the quality that the produce is. If it's leaf burned or tip burned, you can tell. So if a leaf looks like this, that's not something I want to sell or I want anyone else to sell. It's not something that you should have to pay for. And it shouldn't be included in the bag of produce that you buy at the supermarket either. Most of the, one of the things I want to say, this is the greatest country in the world. We have at our fingertips every invention dating back in history, but we've left a lot of things behind. About every 20 or 30 years, we need to go back and revisit what we left behind because it may be applicable today. And things that we could not do 20 years ago are now doable because of technology advances. We have even hydroponics. If you look back in the 60s, you might pay $300 for a pump. The pumps I buy, they're 60 bucks. That's an advance that brings the cost down, brings the overall cost down. This system is a pretty simple system. It's built from 
from commonly used and commonly available items. I can, I can source all of this locally. And it didn't cost me an arm and a leg to put it in. To learn to do this, I couldn't afford to put forty or fifty thousand dollars for that kind of a lesson. And since there's no school in the United States that teaches hydroponics, you're pretty much on your own. Um, I'm available for anybody who wants to learn. I also have a class coming up in at Happy Dancing Turtle um, in Pine River. Um, no, and I can't get the date. Um, we can look it up and then and then mention it. At yeah. Time too. yeah. Um, and. That will be a two-hour class, which will teach people how to build a 90-plant system that they can operate and they can learn from themselves. And I will be there to be able to be available by email or by phone to be able to help them get through any problems that arise. We need to grow year-round up here. We need food, nutritious food, year-round. Not stuff that's grown in California and trucked here. You, you get kale in in California and you bring it here it's been on ice but it's not crisp leaves like this it's wilted because it's been off the plant for four or five days by the time it got here um, that's lost nutrition and it's lost flavor and quality and the issue is to me is I want to eat this I don't want to eat that and most of the people I talk to, that's the issue that we're looking at, especially in winter in Minnesota. Do you engage other family members or friends in your business? If, if yes, what advice do you have for others before they invite or include family, friends um, in, in their business operations? My wife works with me when we do harvest, um, grudgingly sometimes, uh, because it's usually we, when we harvest for the school districts, it's Sunday mornings. And uh, I think she'd rather be resting. She works a five-day five day a week job. Uh, bringing, uh, I have my son work with me when he's available, and he's in the, in the National Guard, so he's not always here. Um, families getting involved could be of great asset. Um, a husband and wife team setting up a hydroponic facility in the middle of the Twin Cities has 12,000 customers within walking distance of your facility. How many customers do you need to keep the facility viable? And once they see the quality, once they see the fact that it's grown there, they can actually walk in and look at what's happening. How many of those people are going to think about, well, geez, maybe. We could do this someplace too. There's a lot of room. In the Twin Cities, you could have a growing facility every square mile. That means within a half a mile of your, your home, you could walk to a facility and buy your fresh produce, buy your salad produce. Um, in the rural environment, you could have one. I've said every 20 miles, I probably rethink that to every 50 miles. Um, 50 square miles. We have food deserts in Minnesota, several of them right in the area, in, in, in the, uh, the Todd Wadena County area. And those are areas that don't have food within 20 miles. Um, that's a shame in this day and age, especially in this country. And growing facilities like this, when you're talking about growing in the ground, you're talking about seven months a year. We need year-round production. It's very difficult to keep a viable business when you're only growing seven months a year. And it's very difficult to keep and justify the market when you're only growing seven months a year. The big conventional people will push you out of the way eventually. This is not the first time locally grown has happened. There was an issue, there was a, a, a big push for it in the late 70s when I was in high school. There was another big push for it in the early 90s. It all went by the wayside because conventional trumped the cards. And they can produce great quantities down in Arizona, in New Mexico, and in, in California, though they're having their own problems right now. Um, cold snaps are damaging not only citrus crops, but 
but lettuce crops. Um, it's creating, costing them an awful lot more money. And I don't think that by the time it's all said and done that they're going to be making any more money than I'd be making here. So I look at it this way. Um, it still comes back to jobs. It comes back to income, and it comes back to people, your local, your neighbors, your, your friends, your kids. I think that families could set up growing facilities and make a decent six-figure income. They need to look at growing systems and they know with especially areas like the Twin Cities in the inner city you have abandoned factories and warehouses you have cement slabs that you could put buildings up on structures up on and grow hydroponically and I would imagine you could probably buy those facilities for a dime because they've been sitting on somebody's bank or on city rolls for decades and sometimes longer to me, we might as well be making use of that. And looking at jobs and even food choices in the inner city, and I have, um, this is a win-win all the way down the line. We, we win because we have healthier people. We win because we have jobs and people can afford to eat decent food. And the choice isn't McDonald's or not. Um, and we have, we win because in the end, it's going to create more jobs and more ideas and more technologies that will, will push this beyond the envelope it's in right now. What kind of feedback do you get? You shared a little bit about this, um, what kind of, but, but I'd love to hear you elaborate on the kind of feedback that you get from your customers about the, the variety of produce that, that you've been selling. I am constantly asking my customers for feedback. It's, it's absolutely necessary in this business. If something's wrong, there's a complaint, I want to know about it. I'll make it right one way or another. I have that ability. Um, I ask people if there's something else they want me to grow or want me to try, or if there's something that they see that, that, that's, that's available in the store that they, they want to see if it can be done. Most produce that I've tried, I've been able to do. I haven't tried pineapples, because I'm and I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't try papayas, and I wouldn't uh, because it just doesn't make sense. That's a tropical, tropical plant. But kale, um, most of the crops, the short-term crops, or crops that you can harvest on a weekly basis. I wouldn't try cabbage in a system like this because you need a long growing season. I wouldn't try corn or grains in a system like this because it makes very little sense. Um, but there's been some huge advances over the last few years in hydroponic growing, especially with fodders. Um, and I believe that if you want to answer the problem with world hunger, you need to build up systems that are mobile and can be transplanted anywhere in the world because in 30 days I can produce a lettuce crop to produce thousands. Uh, those, in, in order to feed those people, you need more than just rice and corn. You need a balanced nutrition and you need to teach them to grow a balanced diet. Hydroponics uses 2% of the water and less than 10, less than 10 of the nutrients that you're going to put on a field crop. You're giving the, the plant exactly what it needs at a measured dose. You're recycling all of your water and all of your nutrients are going back into a main reservoir where the plants can get it um, and, and it, it's constantly circulated. This system runs off a single, one single pump, a quarter horsepower pump. Um, it operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the amount of problems I have with it are minimal. Uh, most of the problem I have with it is because I don't have enough time to spend with it now. I've uh, got other projects that I'm working on. But um, as things progress, um, even my tomatoes, I've grown, I grow differently. Anybody who's seen them, I grow them overhead. They're, up, they're put into bags and they're grown on an overhead trellis, seven feet off the ground. This allows me in a building in a greenhouse that's 30 by 72. It has a 14 foot tall ceiling. In most cases, if you're growing in the ground, you're growing in the bottom six feet of the building. Very seldom do you go above that. Um, 
I grow starting at seven feet and then I have other plants that grow underneath that. It gives me the ability to make more use of the available space in there and not waste the attic space because you have crops that do very well in warm temperatures and if your buildings are vented right you don't have a buildup of warm temperatures up there. They get too hot for the plant. Tomatoes and cucumbers love warm temperatures. They grow very well and when you're reaching up to pick them it makes it that much easier. You've already addressed this too but um, I'll ask you to just speak a little bit further to the question of do you feel you've saturated the local market with your product or not? I depends on what you call local. Um, in order to saturate the market I would I would have to call local staples. And yes, I could saturate the market here. I don't because one, I don't believe in doing that. Um, this isn't about just me. This is about us. Um, if I'm the only grower in the state of Minnesota and I produce 50,000 heads of lettuce and I have a failure, we have 50,000 heads of lettuce that are absent from the market. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The, to me, my vision is to see 10 growers growing 5,000 heads rather than one growing 50,000 heads. The more commercialized you become, the more out of touch you become with your product. I don't see that that's been good in the past and I don't see it's good with the agriculture model that we have today. And how far along that same line, how far do you think or know of that people have traveled to buy your product? <laughs> I've had people um, that come up here for vacation that are waiting in line for it. I have people that come from Wadena, that Brainerd. Uh, I have, I go into Brainerd once a week because I shoot pool league and I carry produce with me when I go into Brainerd because I have people there that want it. Um, I have restaurants in institutions that want it on a regular basis and if I could produce it better than what I am they take everything I can produce. Can you share one of the biggest lessons you've learned in all of this uh, over the last several years? Um, biggest lessons I've learned. Look at if you're going to build a facility or you're going to design a facility look at past designs, look at current designs, and model it to your environment. Minnesota is a very harsh environment in the wintertime, and we need structures designed for growing in this type of, the build, this type of climate. This building itself is a solar greenhouse. It utilizes about 40% of its heat comes from solar and it allows me to grow year-round. Um, I can grow even today there's no heat going in here right now and it's above freezing temperature. If you're growing crops like spinach and kale it's not a big issue. If you keep your nutrient warm, uh, my nutrients are in the in the in ground tanks so they do stay warm, they stay ground, temp ground temperature. Um, the other thing is I don't get discouraged with failure. Um, never, very few things come easily and while I've had fewer failures than a lot of people, um, I have had enough and I don't get discouraged. There is an answer but sometimes it takes two or three tries to get it. So. What, what would you say you love the most about what you do? Um, I think I love the most about this is the input back from the people when they see the quality and they finally realize that they've been cheated. We, what we've gotten for quality of our produce, uh, go to your garden and then go to the store look at the difference of what's going on. Our knowledge of plant production is huge. Our use of that knowledge is very minuscule. We have 
allowed our entire production systems for, especially for soft produce, uh, greens, tomatoes, cucumbers, salad produce, um, to be hijacked to areas of the country because it was convenient. Um, it started back in the 70s with Earl Butts, um, his comment, get big or get out. And we have followed that doctrine pretty much since that date. And having worked in the environment, worked in the rivers, in the wetlands, around the state and around the country, um, I don't see that model as being a good one. We've done an awful lot of damage and we're gonna be hard pressed to fix it. And if we continue to do things the way we have, we're going to get down, sooner or later, we're going to get a tipping point where we're not gonna be able to fix it. We've done an awful lot of damage to our soils. We've done an awful lot of damage to our rivers and wetlands. Anybody who looks at the U.S. Geological Surveys that were done on our watersheds over the last years and look at the contaminants that we have there, um, look at um, the nitrates in the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, look at the dead zone. Um, these are not anomalies. There's a cause of this. We created this. We need to fix it before it gets out of hand and we can't fix it. And the consequence is, is if we can't fix it, we won't be able to grow anymore. Then it will be indoor growing always. It, it, it will be strictly that way because you won't be able to use the soils. There won't be enough nutrients or enough microorganisms to use the nutrients that are there. And you can load up all the pesticides, fertilizers, and anything else you want in the soil. If the plant can't use them, it's a, it's a little or no consequence. So I think all in all, to, I, I enjoy this. It's peaceful. Um, I have uh, also enjoyed being able to teach other people to do it, even though we should have been doing it all along. I regret that we haven't um, come as far as other countries have, and I regret, especially when I've seen what hydroponics can do, I regret that we missed out. We missed out on quality produce, we missed out on jobs. And I believe that if we're going to fix the problem, we need to bring it back to that. It's a matter of jobs, your neighbor's jobs, your jobs. So I, I'm hoping that I'm not preaching too much, and I'm hoping that people will become inspired, because that's what it takes. It's not a matter of teaching. It's a matter of inspiring people to do it. And that's what we need to do back in, even down to this, the high school level. I work with a high school here and I have a hydroponic system set up at the, at the Alternative Learning Center. Um, I want the kids to see what they can do. This is their technology. It was, I'm 54 years old. I'm almost to the end. I mean, they're gonna have to go on beyond this. And they're going to need to do it in a world where we have either higher or lower temperatures because it's not staying the same. We have an unstable climate. Um, they're going to have to do it with either polluted or reduced water. Um, they're gonna have to do it with minimal amount of inputs and they're gonna have to do it soon because we don't have forever to wait for this. By the year 2050, we have to increase food production by almost 70% to be able to meet worldwide demand. And you're not going to do it with the conventional systems that we have right now because we're almost to the max capacity. We can't keep tilling under the prairies and planting more corn. It's not going to solve the problem. There I go preaching again. That's good. That's good. Very <laughs> This is all so very good. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with folks who are watching the webinar or interested in, in um, how they can learn more about hydroponics? Um, as I said, I would first thing I would do is do a Google search. Um, and don't go to the sites that are trying to sell you something. Go to the images. Look at what other countries have done and are doing. Um, this is happening all over the world. Um, many of the peppers and tomatoes are grown in a hybrid hydroponic systems now. Uh, many of the cucumbers are being grown in hydro hybrid hydroponic systems now. Um, they're looking at 
at alternative irrigation systems. They've figured out that it doesn't make sense to keep spraying water overhead when the plant's only using it at the roots. It doesn't make sense in, in putting tons of, of fertilizer on the soil when 60 to 70 percent of it washes into the watershed. We need a better answer for the future or our children are going to pay the price. We've already paid enough prices. We have DDT in our watersheds. We have atrazine in our watersheds that will be there for hundreds of years. These are issues that over time will build up and compound. We have no idea what the future holds in store, but we can write it in a better, better light than what we've got. And I really don't want to see the last 50 years repeated in the next. We did, we made a serious mistake in the 70s, and the way we turned our agriculture put a lot of money in a few pockets. We need it back into a lot of money in a lot of pockets. It's the only answer that I see, because the one that we've got right now, I really don't see it as an answer. I see it as, as creating more of a problem in the future. And one question that came to mind as you were just talking made me realize there's two questions I, I should ask or will. The first one is, and, and we'll probably, as the video editor gets this, we'll maybe, <laughs> maybe have to um, throw this back to early on, but can you describe high, um, just the basic description of what is a hydroponic growing system? Sure. Um, a hydroponic growing system is growing plants in water. Uh, effectively. Um, it's ancient. It goes back to hybrid systems were used back in the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Um, basically what it is is you're, you're taking the nutrient demand of a plant, what it would normally get in the soil or what it needs to grow, and you're giving it in a pure refined form. Um, that allows you to give the plant a low dose constant rate of fertilizer that it can use at any point and it's in a refined form that it doesn't need to use bacteria as soil growing does um, to break that those nutrients down into usable forms and in uh, in hydroponics the root systems actually grow in the channel you see that These are spinach systems. The root systems are fairly complex. They'll grow right on down the channel, um, interlace and interweave. Um, plants do not become root bound because the nutrients are being, while the roots will intermesh, the nutrients are being delivered at a constant rate down through the entire system. So every plant is getting the same amount of nutrients. These these lines on these systems um, provide a constant rate of flow. Right now they're shut off because of the noise of the pump. <coughs> and what I've done here is basically created a system that will, what I've done here is create a system that will create a constant rotation of a crop. I will grow these for some of these plants have that you can see that are that are starting to brown out um, have had eight pickings off them, and they're about ready to be be started over again. Some of these first ones here, you can see these are about three weeks old, and they'll be ready to pick. I've done a few of the lower leaf pickings, but they'll be ready to pick within within a week, and they'll go on for another eight to ten weeks before I have to recrop. By that time. These will, the ones I have started over again, will be ready to harvest. So I can do a constant rotation and a constant supply. The kale is the same way, I can do it. Um, I've been amazed at, at how much production you can get out of how little space. This building is about 10 by 25, which is about 250 square feet. Um, I was, it's been in production for about seven years and it's a solar greenhouse that's set up as a lean-to. It leans up against my, my insulated pole barn. Um, this building is capable of doing, if I were doing romaine lettuce, I could do 60 heads a week out of it during the summertime. I could do 40 heads a week out of it 
in the winter time. The difference between winter and summer growing is the, the shortened day length gives you a longer growing season, which means you have to add 12 to 12 to 15 days onto your growing cycle. And so it adjusts, you're adjusting by that. Uh, it's easy enough. For me, it was very easy to do just because of uh, once the system was up and running, everything pretty much did it itself. Everybody compliments me on my produce, but I'm not growing it. I'm just providing the nutrients. Um, the natural plant is doing everything else. So, um, I don't know if there's anything else I can add to that or not. So, um, with hydroponics in, in this building, I have a reservoir in ground, which is a 300 gallon tub. It's filled with water. The, the water is clear. You can see the bottom of it. It has a very weak nutrient load in it um, that the plants can get. It's, this building is actually using a nutrient that was designed to grow lettuce. It's formulated based on the plant physiology to grow lettuce. It grows spinach fairly well. It grows kale exceptionally well. It grows basil exceptionally well. Most hydroponics has been refined to the point now where you have a nutrient that is designed strictly for tomatoes. You've got one for strawberries, one for cucumbers, one for lettuce, one for herbs. Um, they've got a pepper one. Um, they've even got a difference between a northern and a southern crop because of the day length difference and the the temperature difference. Um, it's made to compensate more for the, the higher temperatures down south. It's gotten so refined now and so um, far advanced that a layman can get into systems. You can go to Crop King and you can you can attend their three-day class and you can come out of there with a basic knowledge of, on, of, of how to grow. You may not want to spend fifty thousand dollars the first day you do it, but you'll have a good enough knowledge that you can step into it on a small scale and graduate up to a larger scale. It's not rocket science, it's plant. And it is getting cold, so... Yeah, so I actually started the, <laughs> the camera again. Can you describe really quickly the, the pump you just turned back on? I just turned on the nutrient pump. Um, that pump uh, pumps from a 300 gallon reservoir in ground. Um, through these lines and you can see the the nutrient going in. It's not a real real high pressure line It's about 15 psi um, I have two lines that go into each one of the gutters Because I believe in redundant systems You're going to have roots that are going to break off and, and come down in the pump If one of them ends up in this system and plugs a line you want to have the other line running and I go through periodically and check all the lines on here to make sure they continue to run. Yeah. Yep, yeah, wash my cords. Very right, good. would not sell. Yeah. Um, I would throw it out or compost it merely because it's um, what I would consider substandard. The stuff that I saw was in the beginning stages of tip burn, which, which means it's calcium deficiency, which means it's not going to be a nutritionally sound crop. So to me, we have the ability to grow the best produce in the world. We have the knowledge base to grow the best produce in the world. The problem is, is you can't expect to grow it 1,500 miles away and truck it here and expect it to still be the best produce in the world. So there's a, there's a big difference between that and growing um, locally. The other thing I really believe is if you want jobs back in rural America or even in the inner city, we need to go back to local production of soft produce. Salad produce can be grown where you eat it, within a 50 mile radius of, the, of 
even up to 250 mile radius. And that's jobs for you, that's jobs for your neighbors, that's jobs for the community, and that's income and revenues all the way down the line. It's a win-win. It's something that we threw away 40 years ago and something that if we're ever going to get our economy stabilized out, we need those jobs back. And you're talking millions of jobs, literally. Uh, good jobs, not jobs in a, in a dry, dry, dusty, 120 degree field. It, this is jobs in a controlled environment similar to this. So I, I'm adamant about it. I'd like to see it in my lifetime. I have no delusions that it'll happen but it does need to move forward and enough people moving forward it's like a landslide one rock doesn't mean much but it kicks another one and keeps moving more and more and pretty soon it's pretty hard to stop it so um, this greenhouse is my latest project it's 3,000 square feet of growing um, hydroponic romaine is what it's intended to grow um, right now it doesn't look too good um, because I shut it down about a week and a half ago. The reason I did that is because I have um, I have a small and a small infestation of white flies. The longer I prolong this problem, uh, the worse it's going to get. The closer to spring I get, the bigger the population, the bigger the problem is going to be. And I don't want to be able to uh, I don't want to have to spray every week in order to manage the problem. In this case, because it's hydroponics, I've got plants that I can start in my basement under lights and then transfer out here. So I have a week and a half to 10 days, um, and, I can, uh, uh, and uh, I can get those started down there. I can strip this out. I can sterilize it with bleach. Eat it and 